was just a, a shorter book. But this is the most messianic, which means it's the, it's the book that talks the most about Jesus. And it's also the most apocalyptic, which it talks about the end times. And uh, how many of you are glad God's control of the end? There's a lot of stuff going out, you know, that talks about, man, what the end. Listen, I am so glad that I am in his fold. I'm so glad that he's got it under control. And, 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 and there, there's speculation and there's lots of studies about the end times. And I believe we're living in them. But I'm so glad his grace is sufficient in what we're dealing with in the world in the, in the end. But, but, but it's so interesting because of how much this book points to the church and how much it points to Jesus. And so there's two main characters kind of in, in, in the story. There's Zechariah. He's the prophet that God sent to speak to to Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel is the king or the ruler of, of the city, and they're being brought back from captivity. I, I love the way, sometimes we, we don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, we feel like maybe the New Testament is easier to read and easier to understand, but, but how many of you know God is the God of the whole entire Bible? That, 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 and when you look at the Old Testament and you look at these stories, you can see really the life of the believer. You can see the journey of Israel and how they disobeyed God and then they went into captivity. Guess what happens when you and I disobey God and we do our own thing? Guess what it leads to? Captivity. And, when we, and then when we try to mix things with God, well, I'll worship God, but I also want to worship this stuff that I got over here. When you mix things, guess what it leads to? It's not freedom. It's loose. It's not freedom. It's more bondage. And Israel faced this. They they wanted to blend in with the, the society. They wanted to be like everybody else. And, and uh, you know, that doesn't stop when you're a teenager. I mean, after you're not a teenager anymore, of blending in and being around you, being a, uh, trying to blend in with, with the world and what's around us. That pressure is always there. So Israel, they had spent all these years in captivity and bondage. They were slaves to, to Babylon. It was a, a larger city and a larger uh, uh, empire at the time. But then... God begins to send the prophets. And this particular prophet, Zechariah, he was actually born in Babylon. And he, he was a man that God raised up to speak the word of the Lord. And, and the word of the Lord at this time, it, it, it came through prophets. It came through messengers like this. And, and then he goes to the king, and this is kind of where we pick up the story. I want to read it to kind of give you the context of, of where we're going. He says, now the angel who talked with me came back, and he wakened me, and is a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking, and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the, on the stand, there's seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. And so I answered and I spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? And then the angel who talked with me answered, and he said, you don't know what these are? And he re repeats it again, no. I said, I don't know what they are. I don't, I don't know what this is. And then he begins to answer him. And he begins to describe the, the lampstands and what they represent. And this imagery is, 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 represents the church. See, you remember the Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are the light of the world. That, that you are the salt and the light of the world. And, and the lamp or, or the light of the world isn't just placed under a, a basket. If it wants to light up the whole room, it's put on a lampstand. And all through the scripture, we see the lampstand used in the Old Testament and New Testament as the light. See, God didn't, he, he sent Jesus, but he sent Jesus and Jesus established his church so that everybody in the world could taste and see that God is good through the church. God doesn't do anything outside of his church. I'm just telling you, there's an anointing and there's a power and, and there's an energy available in this room that we can tap into today that I won't get on my couch at the house. You can't, you can't get it. It comes from being corporately together in what God is doing in the church. And the church is not a building. It's not even a physical lampstand. It was this spiritually, we're the light of of the world and and man there's so much imagery and so much meaning behind that and, and and really it would take weeks for us to talk about it maybe sometime we'll do it but don't worry we're not going to do it today but 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 i want you to see that that everything that comes after this everything that, that the, the grace that flows the, the empowerment that flows the the, the 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 supply that flows is coming from the church it's coming from zerubbabel's connection and priority when it comes to the kingdom of God and what God is building. It's a powerful, powerful point. 
He says to Zerubbabel, he says, It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Anybody ever heard that scripture before? There's a couple more right here that are, that are popular, come from the same passage. He says, who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. He says, moreover, the word Lord came to me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, and his hands shall also finish it. Aren't you glad you serve a God who's the author, but he's also the finisher of your faith? And I love this. He didn't say God was going to do it. He said God was going to do it with Zerubbabel. That Zerubbabel laid the foundation, but Zerubbabel would finish it. I just believe the Lord declares over you today, what you started, you'll finish. What you, what was birthed inside of you at one time, meant God will finish it. There's a grace and a supply that comes not just for the beginning and the start of what you're doing, but also the finish and the end. The hands of Zerubbabel will start it and finish it. And he says, then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice. Who are the seven? He's talking about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God sees. He says, to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. The, hand, the plumb line, it was this building tool. It was the measuring. It was, what, it was what at the end of the project he came and he measured just to make sure everything was just right. It says, the Lord, you, Zerubbabel, you haven't even started building yet, but I just want to let you know, we already see the plumb line in your hands. God will do what he said he's going to do. He says, they are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. I want to remind you of a of scripture that, that Jesus said. Jesus told, he was having a conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well. And he told her in, in John, he says, he says that the Father is looking to and fro. That he's looking for true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Do you know what God is always looking for? Worshipers. He's always looking for worshipers. He's not, he's not looking for doers. He's looking for worshipers. Because he knows if I can find a worshiper, that, that I'm going to find a doer. But a lot of times, we start with doing, and then we kind of worship if we have some time. You see what I'm saying? That, 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 that our worship is kind of the side dish to our doing. And we don't understand that worship is the main course of everything that God wants to do in our lives. It's this very powerful thing, and we're going to come back to it in just a second, of what Zerubbabel found first what before he would before he started to to walk into the the assignment before there was restoration of what God wanted to do in this city when there was rubble all around and that just it wasn't making sense what was what was happening Zerubbabel was trying to figure out what am I even doing here but he started with worship and we'll come back there in just a second but what does this have to do with grace when you and I begin to walk and try to work for God in our life instead of living out our life through a relationship with God, we've stepped out of grace and we've stepped into work. It's the work versus grace. And, 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 and then we've moved from this place of, of receiving this overflowing grace that's, that's just more than we could ever contain, and we've taped steps backwards to a grace that we can hold in our hand and a grace that we can just, just that little drop of grace. It's like a mouthwash cup full of grace. It's like a, like a little squirt gun. Of just, just a little bit of grace. But it's not that, is it? Think about the grace that found you. Think about the saving grace of, of God. Let's talk about the, these, these different, these four forces of grace that we see throughout the Bible. The first one is this. It's saving grace. And we see this in, through, throughout the New Testament. But probably the most popular verse and the foundational verse when it comes to saving grace. Ephesians 2.8 it says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. For it is not from yourselves, it's a gift from God. Say gift. That's actually the word grace. That grace is a gift. Grace comes from the word charisma. It was this, it was this free gift from God. You're not saved by how good you are. We're not good so that we can get God. We get God so that there's good works that follow. Think about the difference. 
And a lot of us even, even man, we, we know, hey, we know in our heads, hey, we're saved by grace. But a lot of times we come to church and we read our Bibles and we even sing songs. And we do acts of worship because we think that it pleases God, that it makes us, um, it does please God. But we think that it's getting us to God instead of doing it from a place because we have God. See, you have the favor and the blessing of God. That's why you have reason to rejoice. You don't rejoice and, and do good things because you're trying to get God to like you. Can I just tell you, he can't like you any more than he already does. Well, I just feel like God's displeased. Sometimes he is displeased. But I just want you to think about it, just in the sense of, uh, of being a parent. It, it, I, the reason I, I, I challenge, the reason uh, I, I discipline, the reason I, I chastise, the reason that I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm grooming, it's an equipping process so that my kids can have the most fruitful life and they can accomplish the assignment that God has for them. If I just let them loose and let them do whatever they want, is that really love and is that really grace? And sometimes we want a grace that we can hold in a cup and that we can understand. But that's not enough, y'all. We need a grace that we, it's so, it's, it's, it's what's the right word, unfathomable? Adfath, I can't say that word, but you know what I'm saying. It's just, it's, it's, it's too big to even be able to say it with that word. It's, it's giant. It's, it's, you can't fathom it. There we go, I found a great way to say it. It's, it's, you can't comprehend it. You can't wrap your brain around this kind of grace. See, you know you, and I know me. And think about where he came to get us. Think about, he passed through heaven and became a man. He moved in, I love John chapter one, it says that Jesus moved into the neighborhood. He didn't send a message for you, God sent a person. And he came and he showed up. And this, listen, listen, listen to this, he didn't, he, he didn't say, hey, and this is a beautiful picture to say, hey, come up where I am, let me bring you up here. But that's not what he did. Jesus stepped down into the earth to walk with you and to carry you up where he is. Get the, get the imagery here. He, he didn't just say, hey, he didn't just call us. He came and got us. Woo! Saving grace. And here, here's a, a key. Well, I'm not worthy to receive grace. Well, I'm not worthy to be where I'm at. You're right, you're not. That's why Jesus paved the way. That's why Jesus came, so that you could have saving grace. And when the first time you start trying to earn it, we miss it. He doesn't, start, he doesn't stop extending it, but we can't be in a position to earn grace. We have to live our lives in a position to receive it. Receive saving grace. And the time when we received, you hear that? He was excited about that. She was excited about that. Somebody's excited in here about some grace. But, but, but watch what happens. I want you to think back to the moment where Jesus found you. Yeah, that place. That place that he found you. You, you weren't looking for a squirt gun of grace. Y'all, I needed a whole, a whole, I need a Niagara Falls grace to come and to soak me. But guess what? He didn't just give you grace to save you. Then he gave you grace that justifies you. He gave you grace that, that justifies you. Look, look at what Titus says when it talks about justifying grace. He says this, Titus 3, 7, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, children, inheritors, having a hope of eternal life. So look at this. He said, hey, I'm saving you and I'm wrapping you with this cloak of grace that you couldn't have earned. Nothing you could do to earn it. But now I'm, un I'm justifying you. This is where he changes our identity. And where we were a sinner, now he turns us from sinner to saint. And he says, you're mine. That you're my heir. When he, looks at, when he looks at you, guess what he sees? He doesn't see you in your sin. He sees Jesus. I love the description. I, my my father-in-law taught this for years and helped just ingrain this in our hearts. And they said, he said this, he said, justified to understand justifying grace it's just as if i'd never sinned just think about that for a second just as if i'd never sinned there's this saving grace this unmerited favor that comes to rescue you this this blanket of grace 
But there's also, it doesn't just leave you with a blanket of grace and a feel good. It justifies you. It tells you this just as if I had never sinned. Listen to this. God told the psalmist, he told David, he says, I've separated your sin as far as the east is from the west. Think about that geographically. The east and the west never touch each other. He says, I've, I've cast it in the sea of unforgetfulness. And, and, then, and then people go, well, well, well does God, he, he has a loss of memory? No, 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 no. Listen to this. This is where grace comes into being. He chooses not to remember your sin. He makes a choice. God makes a cognizant choice not to remember your sin. Just as if you never sinned. So if anybody brings up sin to God or brings it up in the relationship with God, it's not God, it's you. If every, if any, I, I think a, a lot of times in our walk with God, we, there's this, this, we forget the justifying grace. We forget that, that, that grace is not an issue anymore. Here's what we have to under, understand. I, I love this idea and this, this concept of grace too is when we understand that sin does not keep you away from heaven. Not receiving the grace and believing it through faith is what keeps people out of heaven. We think that, well, if you sin, well, if, you, if you've got sin in your life or you've got this in your life, no, 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 you have a grace that came. It was favor, unmerited favor. You didn't get it because you did everything right. You didn't get it because you came to church. You didn't get it because you read your Bible. You don't read your Bible to get grace. You read your Bible to understand grace. You don't come to church because you, you got it figured out. You come to church. Because you've got a God who's got you figured out. And because you're complicated, and I am too. We need the spirit of grace, and we need the spirit of God to help us make sense of the assignment and the purpose that he has us here for. So you have a grace that saves you, a grace that justifies you. And where does this justification to, I want to segue between justifying grace to this teaching grace because the teaching grace is one that I don't think a lot of Christians aren't walking in and aren't living in. We're not drinking from that well of resource. But, but the justifying grace is so beautiful because it's this process of where you submit your life under God. A lot of people think, well, well I raised my hand and I submitted my life to Jesus. That, that was a decision. But, but there's this grace and this salvation that is worked out in your life because salva- it's not just a decision. Salvation is an event that begins with the de- Excuse me. Is, um, help me. Thank you. It is a process that begins with an event. There's this, there's this process that you, that you work out. How, how many of you know you didn't say yes to Jesus and then everything else became flat and easy in your life? Some of us said yes to Jesus and it got harder. Some of you, I'm just letting you to know, t- today, you, some of you are living right now in pre-challenge. You think that everything is great and everything is perfect and everything is in order, but, but guess what? Just because you heard a message of grace and you celebrated the grace of God doesn't mean that there's not going to be obstacles, that there's not going to be challenges. He says, in this world, you're going to face trials, you're going to face tribulations, but this is what he said, Woo, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, that I have overcome the world. That, that listen, that you'll never be in a place where there's not grace for you. Think about that. Well, what if I get sick? There's a grace for that. What if my kids go crazy? There's a grace for that. What if your kids don't? What if they stay straight and serve the Lord the rest of their life? There's a grace for that. What if I fall? There's a grace for that. What if I don't? There's a grace for that. What's the point? The point is that when you... When you allow the cloak of God, of grace to come around you, you're saved, you're justified. But as you stay submitted to him, there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be things that you're going to face. He promised that it would happen. Listen, if they nailed him to the cross, that's a pretty big challenge, right? If, if, if they're going to kill him. If, if, if Jesus dealt, he's the, he's the holy, perfect son of God. But, but Hebrews says that he dealt with every sin and every temptation that you dealt with. Yet he did not sin. He was victorious in those things. And if that's, if that's the God we serve, if that's the, 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 that God dealt with, and we, we know we're going to deal with challenges, we're going to deal with those things. But there's a difference in dealing with challenges 
under grace and because we're pursuing God and, 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 and walking and dealing with challenges because we're disobedient to God. And this is where teaching grace comes in. A lot of times people, they, they will think, and, and not us, but you know, other people, okay? Other people say this. They say, well, I can really do whatever I want, and maybe we don't say it out loud, but we think to ourselves, I can do whatever, uh, whatever I want. I'm under grace. Michael said that this unmerited favor, that there's this grace that overflows. But you've got to understand, are you in the position to receive grace? We're saved by grace, but it requires something. It's through what? Faith. And faith without works is dead. And this is a lot of times where we get so confused. We get confused. Well, is it grace or whether it works? We talked last week. It is, it is when you're walking your faith journey out in your relationship with God. Are you going to sin? Yeah. Are you going to fall short? Yeah. But you don't sit there. Listen, you're going to sin, but sin doesn't have you. There's a difference. And this is where teaching grace comes in. The favor that we can expect from God, the Niagara Falls grace that we can expect from God comes when we've submitted ourselves under him. God can't make you submit. You have to make the choice of faith to submit to God. He says, when you submit to God, resist the devil. What's the devil have to do? Flee. But here's what happens. A lot of times we're trying to resist the devil and he won't go anywhere. And we're still struggling with the same stuff we've struggled with because we never submitted to God. Grace enables us to submit to God. And it comes with, look, teaching grace. Look at this, this equipping, this teaching grace. Titus 2.12, it says it teaches us to say no. Just practice that. You ready? One, two, three. There you go. All right, I know it's tough. Try it again. You ready? One, two, three. There you go. No, you have the power. Oh, I just can't say no. Yes, you can. Why? Because there's teaching grace that enables you to say no. What are you saying no to? To ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled. Well, I just can't control myself. Yes, you can. There's a grace for that. Well, this is just the way I am. No, it's not. That's not the way God made you. There's a grace for that. There's teaching grace that comes alongside. And this is where we walk that the very presence of God dwells with us, walks out this salvation with us, and he teaches us how to honor our wife. He teaches us how to honor our husband. He teaches us how to, to train up our kids in the way they should go. He teaches us how to set your alarm and get up and be at work on time. He teaches you how to get a date. He teaches you how to walk honorably before the Lord. But what does it require? Not just that I... I, I just bask in this pool of saving grace that I just bask in this pool of, uh, I'm, well, I'm justified, and so it's okay that I do whatever I want. No, 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 no. If we've settled for a life where we can do whatever I want, that's not grace. It's religion. It's religion. It's, it's rules and regulations where we feel like we're doing things to get God to notice us. We're doing things to get other people to notice us. Look how, I, look how wonderful I am. Look how, and the, remember the religious leaders in the Bible. There were just a few groups of people that Jesus got really ticked off at. And one were the religious leaders. And he called them whitewashed tombs. Why? Because they were whitewashed. They were all polished on the outside. But they were missing the ingredients of the inside. They were missing the grace. And they were trying to get to God instead of understanding that Jesus, God himself, was standing right in front of them. And you can be so close to this waterfall of grace and miss it because we just drink from a cup. You can be so close in your life to walking in this teaching grace, but because we're not willing to submit our actions or, or who we are and, and really find who we are in God, because we're not willing to submit that particular habit or that particular, particular uh, addiction, and what we do is we say no to grace, and we end up walking in disgrace, not the grace of God. And I know it's a quiet feeling in the room because when grace comes to challenge us, we we begin to call it, well, that's just, there's just no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I love that LifeGate Church as long as he says those good things that make me feel warm inside. But you know, we want to love our father because he's a good father. And we want to love the house of God because it just doesn't give us part of the the piece of the puzzle that we like and that we understand and we comprehend. I, I want, I think there's this willingness of submission to God that says, God, whatever comes, I just want you. 
Give me you. I, Jesus, I, I want you and everything that you have for me, no matter what. And, and Zerubbabel, he begins to, to do this in his life. He, he, he's got all this rubble around him. He's got all this, this uh, listen, it, it's right in the middle of the yet incomplete. It's right in the middle of a building project where, where all the tools were laid to the ground. And, and listen, they had been in captivity for 16 years. There was a lot in front of him physically that wasn't evidence of God's grace. It didn't look like evidence of God's, uh, you know, work in their life. It, 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 was, it didn't look like what it was supposed to look when it seems like it's under grace. But, but the word of the Lord comes to Zerubbabel and he says this important message. He says, give me the permission to kind of read in between the lines. He's, he's got this assignment. Zerubbabel, God's got this assignment for you that's bigger than what you could think. And I, and I know what it looks like on the outside. But I just want to remind you, Zerubbabel, that, that God's got something special for you. And, and you laid the foundation of this temple. And, and you're going to see it erected. And you're going to see it proved to be everything that God has called it to be. And here's what I love. Remember I told you it was the church? Hasn't the church been a testament of God's grace? Think about it. We're thousands of years from when this prophecy was first given. And we see the faithfulness of this this man of this ruler and and he started with one thing this is where he started he started with worship he the first thing he did was was at the foundation he created an altar an altar of sacrifice and, and, and the first thing he wanted to do was saying, hey, I know we've got a lot to do for God. I know we've got a lot of work to do. But, but can I tell you, grace doesn't start with the work. Grace starts with worship. Grace stops when, starts when, when you take your eyes off of yourself and you look at Jesus. Gra- grace uh, comes to full effect. It, becomes, it moves from this cup to, to this overflowing when you take your eyes off of your sin. The reason Jesus came and removed sin is because it, it separated us from him, but, but he didn't want it brought up again. And the only time he brings up sin is to challenge us. Why? So he can remove it. Can I just tell you, God is not in the business of just picking on you. Well, you're just not holy. Pick, pick, pick. Well, you're just not worthy. Pick, 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 pick. And the enemy wants to confuse us and to, to make us think that if, that if God is touching on a sore spot in our life or, or the message coming forth from, from that day or the song that was sung challenges an area of our life, well, that's not grace. Yes, it is. It's teaching grace. And if you'll be taught, you'll grow up. And when you're sitting here the next week, you won't be dealing with the same thing that you were dealing with. The last time I checked, we're supposed to be moving forward in grace, not moving backwards in grace. Was there a time in your life where you were drinking from the fountainhead of grace and now because you've said no to God and haven't submitted everything to him that now you're drinking from a a Dixie cup? Was was there a time because your understanding was, 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 well, man, I get it, I just understand, but then there comes this challenge in our life and we don't understand and so we settle for less of God's grace. And God is so big, there's gonna be times that you have breakthrough and you understand But more times than not, you're not going to get why he does what he does. It's in the sufficiency of his grace that he meets us right where we are. And we've got to trust him that he's going to do exactly what we need, however we need it done. That it's for our good. We have a God that is for us. We have a God that wants the best for you. And you have a God that has an assignment for you. He has work for our hand. He had work for Zerubbabel to do, but it didn't start with Zerubbabel picking up a tool. It started with Zerubbabel lifting up his hands. And you know where he found grace? In the presence of God. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit. And I think instead of all the work and all the the, the turmoil that we feel because we're not submitting to God, if we'll just lay down the tools and we'll just submit ourselves to the Lord, in order to say, God, come have your way. He comes with saving grace and justifying grace. And he comes with a grace that teaches you and helps you grow and makes you better and helps you accomplish everything. that he, it, it, it makes you better, but, but he didn't die to make you better. He died so that you could look more like Jesus. He wants to teach you to look like Jesus. There's a grace that helps you look more like Jesus. And to know what's godliness and what's not, what, what, what's ungodliness. What does it look like to be a Christian in 2017? 
What does it look like to be the church? And to, to, What does it look like? We need the grace to understand that. It's not going to be something that we can fathom and control on our own. It's a grace that's, that's way bigger than that. And then it's a grace that enables. And we're going to pick up here and go next week and take it to, the, to a whole other place. There's so much here in the story of Zerubbabel. But I just thought it was so powerful that he didn't start with the building. He started with the worship. And really, in the worship, you're building. And sometimes, like I said just a moment ago, that worship is kind of a side dish to the rest of our life instead of worship being the very foundation of who we are. Where we look to Jesus. See, you can't look to the world and look to Jesus at the same time. And grace doesn't come from this world. We know that, right? Grace only flows from heaven. And there's this open heaven and this flow, and we tap in to grace. And I thought it was neat. You know, he, he created a place of sacrifice. The history of sacrifice was to remove sin. But I don't know if y'all heard about this guy named Jesus. He was the once and for all sacrifice. And in our worship and when we declare, hey, give me Jesus. Can, 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 can. Listen, I understand I got all this stuff happening in my life. I understand I got an assignment, but, but will you give me Jesus? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set my eyes and I'm going to set my heart on Jesus. I'm not going to find who I am in my work. I'm not going to hide under grace. Grace isn't a place to hide in. Grace is a place where I find who God's given me to be, who he's called me to be, and then I'm equipped for the assignment that he's called me to do. And I want to challenge you this morning. Have you settled for less? And do we need to up the grace? Not the grace that God gives us, but the grace that we're receiving. I believe that's what he has for us today. Will you stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? I want to take just a few minutes to to respond to the force of grace. We're going to worship in just a second. But the first grace that we talked about was this grace that, that comes to save, comes to deliver, comes to, to heal and restore our relationship with God. And if you're here today and you say, Michael, man, I, I know you're talking to me. I don't have a relationship with Jesus, and I need this saving grace. I want to remind you it's not something you can earn. You're not going to get it because you're good enough. You get it because you've decided to receive it by faith. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're not going to embarrass you or call you out. This is between you and Jesus. But I want to know that I'm praying with you. If that's you today and you say, Michael, I need saving grace today. I need to surrender my life to him. I want that, that cloak of grace and that, that blanket of grace to wrap around me because he's a good father. Today, I submit my life to him. If that's you, would you just boldly just lift up your hand and say, Michael, that's me. Will you pray for me? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands all over the room. Saving grace, saving grace. Yes, ma'am, I see you back there. Yes, sir, I see you. Yes, sir, I see you. Yes, ma'am, I see you. A whole family, yes, way to go. Way to go, yes, sir. Saving grace, saving grace, saving grace. We're going to pray in, in just a second, but, but if you're here today and you say, Michael, I... I'm saved. I've, I've received saving grace. I, I've even tapped into to justifying grace. I have felt that and experienced that before. But, but I know there's a grace that God has been trying to, he's been trying to get a hold of me and teach me to walk in godliness. And I've resisted. I've resisted. I've settled for less. And there are some areas of my life I keep running into the same thing. And it's not because God's not trying to help me. It's because I haven't been submitted. And today I know he's here. To help me, I receive, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing right now. I know he's tapping on my heart. And today, you're ready to submit to him. To submit to saving grace. Here's what I want to ask you to do. I, we're not just going to one hand this thing. But I want you just to open both hands to the Lord. And just lift up both hands to him if that's you. And right now, you're asking God, come with teaching grace. A grace that helps me overcome. A grace that walks with me through every challenge and through every obstacle. And right now, we're replacing disobedience with obedience. Dishonor with honor. The spirit of grace coming right now, responding to your obedience and responding to your faith to help you walk out what this salvation looks like.
Father, I thank you all over the room right now. You see hands, you see their hearts. Holy Spirit, you're meeting them in such a powerful way. God, I thank you for the supernatural ability, beyond natural uh, ability, natural experience, to walk this thing out. Not in their own effort, not in their own strength. It's not by might, it's not by, by, by their own power, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord. And I just want to speak to those right now that are receiving that. I just feel like the Lord would say to you, to receive the grace, but then you have to make the choice to walk in it. That there are some decisions of faith for you to walk in this thing. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes, he convicts, he challenges, but he comes to help you walk this thing out. So there may be some relationships that need to, to not be there anymore. There may need to be uh, some boundaries. Listen, boundaries are a blessing. God gives you to them so that you walk in freedom. He's begin to walk this thing out with you. God, I thank you. Freedom in this room. Freedom all over this room. Thank you that chains are falling to the ground. God, I thank you for, for new realms and, and of, of, free, of, of freedom and understanding grace in a way that's beyond what we could, we could ever imagine. Because you love your people so much, Lord. You want us to be free. You want us to walk in the fullness of your grace. So we pray, every heart, every spirit, thank you. Thank you for grace. If you've raised your hand for either one of those things, I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now. And I'm going to ask you to do this. Will you repeat after me? I'm going to just give you the words to say and us say to our Father as a prayer of commitment to Him. You ready? Here we go. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for Jesus. Jesus, today I receive your grace. Today I receive your grace. Not, not just a cup of grace. But a grace that overflows. A grace that I can't contain. I receive right now saving grace. Thank you for loving me so much that you came, that you died on the cross, that you rose again. You defeated death so that I could walk in victory. So I accept the price you paid. I'm yours, I'm not mine anymore. I belong to you. Now, God, I thank you for the power of obedience released in my life. Today in faith, I commit to you. I receive teaching grace, the power to walk victorious, the power to turn from sin and to turn to you. And right now, I receive grace that saves, that justifies, that teaches, and enables me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand for that. Hey, you're going to walk in victory this week. Some of you, years, 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 years. And there might be something that would come to you right now and say, well, I, ah, that was just... That was just this. That was just, that was just hype. That was just a moment. That was just, no, 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 no. I declare over you blessing and favor, unmerited favor, grace that abounds in every area, victory in your life, addiction, sickness, sin, obstacles and challenges have to bow their knee to the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hey, listen, if you prayed that prayer today, you prayed a prayer and made a decision to Jesus listen tell us about it I know you did it with God it's a private thing but let us know about it we want to come alongside you and help you in this incredible journey and so you can text decided to the number that comes up on the screen now you can fill out a, or you can fill out a connection card that's found in the seat in front of you put it in an offering box we're not going to bug you we want to help you we want to come alongside you be a family you need the family of God to walk out this grace that God has for you amen Hey, I, 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 I love singing, and this is what I want us to do. I want us just to, to sing again. I know we're, we're, uh, we got a few minutes left, but if you will, don't leave. Let's take a moment, and let's just declare to, declare to the Lord, hey, you can take this world. You can take whatever is challenging me. You can take whatever. Give me Jesus. I want to lift my eyes. Zerubbabel lifted his eyes, and he got his eyes on Jesus, and then, and then we're going to see this next week, but his, God's grace supplied everything that was needed for the assignment, and it's the same for you. God's grace will supply everything you need. So let's one more time. Let's lift our hands to the Lord. Lord, Father, right now we come.
we thank you we come boldly to your throne of grace and we just worship you and we say take this world take everything god we want jesus we set our eyes on you and we sing and declare this in this place in jesus name amen come on let's sing church